Hello, I'm William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and in this video, I'm going to continue walking through this um, this video titled Mass of the Ages, Episode 2, which I promised friends that I would uh, walk through and uh, react to, as it were, comment on. Um, we've had two videos so far, and we've just gotten through, I don't know, um, just under nine minutes of the video. Uh, I've taken a lot of time because a lot of the, a lot of the problems that will be found throughout these videos, um, you know, I can comment on them quickly in the first few minutes, and then we'll just see examples of those problems multi multiplied again and again and again through the, through the remainder of the, uh, of the video. Uh, you know, a few of them that I've identified so far have been. Um, you know, an appeal to an ignorant emotional audience. Um, that's why there's all this spectacle and, and uh, this clever editing and um, animation clips from cartoons and silly sources, uh, all of this sort of sarcastic, cocky um, argumentation. You know, that's all aimed at an ignorant emotional audience. Um, I've pointed out the injustice of, of, of making uh, accusations against people before evidence is presented, um, and and making an appeal to people who have already judged, rather than encouraging people to reserve judgment until the accusations have been confirmed and demonstrated, um, we see the opposite of that in this video. We see that this video caters to an unjust, uh, prejudicial audience that is that is that is already judged the church. Uh, negatively, and is now looking for someone to provide uh, an artificial narrative and evidence to support the judgment that's already been made, which is what, you know, the worst people in modern society do. We've looked at the flaws in um, arguments and statements that have been made, and, and you know, most importantly, we've we've looked at the fact that for all of the uh, all of the spectacle and background music and effects and all this kind of there's no substance in any of this there's no substance there's no there's no foundation for any proof in any of this it's all just uh cheesy rhetoric aimed at um uh aimed at a, an audience that you know I would never want to be my target audience um and it's intended to to get attention from people who have already made these decisions. And so that's what we've talked about in the first two videos. I've commented on how it's childish and, and really silly to, to consider how grave the topic is that the church may have erred. You know, it's sort of the ultimate issue, the most grave possible issue in the world, and it's treated, you know, in sort of a careless, irreverent, mocking kind of way that, uh, that, that reveals that, that this is childish. It's, it's not serious. The people talking, you know, they, they have no authority. They, 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 they don't, they're not people who have the spirit that would be found in people who had a serious case, an objective case against the hierarchy of the church. These people are not those people. And we can see that just by their disposition, how lightly they take the subject, how silly their video is, how, how childish it is. So those red flags were pointed out um, in the first two videos, and we're simply going to pick up here and continue. So if you're coming to this video first, don't, don't start here. I recommend you go back and watch the others because I've talked a lot about uh, the details of these criticisms that I just summarized, but we're going to continue here, picking up around the nine-minute mark. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Immediately after the promulgation of Sacrosanctum Concilium, Pope Paul VI called him in and gave him the opportunity of being the secretary of the Concilium. The Concilium was the organism that was set up to put into practice the constitution on the liturgy. And this was Bonini's great moment of opportunity. 
It's very important for people to understand that the role of secretary in a body like this is much more important than it might sound. You know, okay, so a, a few comments here. I have a very hard time listening to this guy because this guy is just worm tongue. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. What we've learned now is that Bunini was appointed by the Pope. By the Pope. So the Pope, the successor of St. Peter, the source of unity in doctrine or in faith and morals in doctrine and worship, the source of the unity of Christ's church on earth, the successor of St. Peter. He chose Bunini to have a role in the council. Now, we have the successor of St. Peter approving of him for this role. And we have the opinion of some guy contradicting the Pope on a matter of ecclesiastical judgment, of liturgical judgment. Now, as a Catholic, why in the world would you be doubting at this point? Why would you be doubting the Pope and trusting this guy who is now, he, he's not going to tell you that Pope, you know, P Pope Paul VI appointed Bunini to be the secretary of this and that. He's not going to let it rest there. He's going to have to interpret for you what that means so that you can continue following the narrative. And now his explanation here, this is why I say this guy is like the worm tongue of this narrative. He's going to tell you how you need to interpret Bunini's selection to the role of secretary. He's going to tell you what that really means. And this is another example where the dumb, dumb audience is sitting there just gulp, swallowing down another assumption that's being fed to you by the person spinning this narrative. When he says this, this, this guy here, when he says these things, what proof is there for any of the assertions that he makes? What proof is there? What proof does he give? He doesn't give us any proof for what he says. He tells us what to think, expecting no requests for proof, because he's simply facilitating the narrative. He's coloring in all the gaps. He's connecting the lines to make this narrative go on. And if you have already judged and you, you already are suspicious of the church and you're told, well, the Pope selected Bunini to be the secretary why, why would you think that that was bad? Oh, because you've already accepted the assumption that Bunini is up to some, some kind of evil plot. You've already accepted. But that's the question. That has never been proven. That's been assumed from the beginning. And now, because you accepted the assumption that, that Father Bunini is some kind of evil, you know, destroyer of the church, now that Pope Paul VI has appointed him to be secretary, now you're looking at Pope Paul VI and saying, oh my goodness, he's an evil pope. Now the pope is evil because you've already judged Bunini to be evil, though you have no evidence of that other than this constant interpretation that you've heard from, from Worm Tongue here, you've, you've been told that, I forget what the exact number was, 2,147 bishops 
supported the document that was produced, four objected. And again, we don't know why they objected. That's just part of the, the web of assumptions that's now building all of this suspicious assuming. There's no evidence, not a single piece of evidence has been offered. And what you're seeing here, and what, what I want you to see, is you're being told by this guy how you should think about the hierarchy of the church. He's not proving that any of this was bad. He's not proving that there was any kind of plot behind the scenes. He's not proving these things. He's telling you the narrative. He's feeding this to you, assuming that you already have this evil, sinful suspicion and doubt concerning the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, and you're going to gobble it up. You're going to gobble it up. No evidence. All this suspicion, none of it has been proven yet at all. There's no substance. Let's back up just a tad. And that the role going. of secretary in a body like this Ugh, I don't know is how you much more important things. than it might sound. You, know, you might think, oh, secretary, he's just keeping minutes and he's filing documents like and stuff. No, the secretary in this case no. was the one who coordinated all of the meetings of the different scholars. And, and he's the one who was the kind of central clearinghouse for communications. So when people wrote in with their ideas or their criticisms or something, it all went through the secretary. Uh, and, and then he ran the meetings as well. So he established the agendas for the meetings. So the, the secretary was the one he, who really had the bird's eye view of the entire project. Instead of a group of, of scholars working together on, say, the whole mass, it was many different subcommittees working on many different parts of the mass. Of the... Notice one little red flag there. Notice he, he says it wasn't like a community or a group of scholars. These aren't scholars. These are bishops of the church. This is a matter of church authority. You can see this. This is sort of this little psychological slip. Like, oh, you can imagine if it was like a, a community of scholars all conjured, then it would be good. So says a scholar. This is, this is the hierarchy of the church. And again, he's now saying that, that, that Bunini sort of you know, hijacked the whole council by this role as the secret. What, what evidence is there? What evidence is there that that's true? This is just, this is just a continuation, uh, an accumulation, I should say, of accusation after accusation after accusation, and it's just drunk in. It's just drunk in by the audience. Assumption, assumption, accusation, accusation, assumption. No evidence. No evidence. But one of the few people who had the, a, a picture of the whole desired outcome was Bunini. Prove it. Prove Cardinal it. Lacaro was named the nominal head of this concilium, but uh, he... Um, Lacaro was old and doddering, and I don't even know how cognitively alert he was. Bonini kind of... Notice the assumption there. We don't know how cognitive this person was. So, so we're going to now doubt that he was thinking clearly. Well, if we're not sure about that, why would we assume it? Why would we assume something bad? if we're not sure. That's not how just men think. Now, one thing about, you know, this is a bishop here. One thing I noticed is that we've seen two bishops so far in the video. And again, presenting the words of a bishop le appears to lend some credibility. Both of these bishops are from the same diocese. They were both from the bishop, uh, from the diocese of, of Lincoln, I'm assuming Nebraska. Um, he is a, a bishop emeritus, or retired bishop, and the other bishop, I guess, was the acting bishop at the time. But why would we say something like, I don't know if he was thinking clearly at the time? That's another suspicion. We either know that or we don't. 
if we know that, then fine. We can, we can, we, there should be some evidence of that and we can, we can take that into consideration. But if we don't know, why would we say that? Why would I say, you know, my, my bishop just approved the, the construction, you know, recently of a new, of a new seminary. I'm not really sure if my bishop is all there. You know, I'm not sure if my bishop has all of his cognitive power working. But why would I say that except to feed this evil suspicion? Why would I do that? If I have no, if I have no evidence that there's anything wrong, why would I suggest that? This isn't how just men think. And I'm sorry that, that it comes from you know, the mouth of a bishop. And, I, and again, we see parts and clips, and, and that's never, um, that's never uh, helpful because I really don't know what this bishop said altogether. Um, we've seen, you know, words pulled out of Bonini's writing. We're seeing words pulled out of these interviews. We don't know what the rest of the content was. So, you know, I'm not going to pick on a bishop, of course, because... I would want to give him the benefit of the doubt that he didn't intend some kind of evil suspicion. And yet his words pulled out of that interview and now inserted into this video support this narrative that we should be suspicious. All of this evil was going on. The bishops were, were, were clueless and careless. Now we have another representative of the church who maybe wasn't all there cognitively. The video is being crafted with clips pulled, and I don't know the full context of what this bishop had to say. It's unfortunate. Let's back up a little bit. And parts of the Mass at the same time, but one of the few people who had the, a, a picture of the whole desired outcome was Bonini. All suspicion. Cardinal Lacaro was named the nominal head of this concilium, but uh, he... Um, Lacaro was old and doddering, and I don't even know how cognitively alert he was. Yet he was Bunini chosen. kind of took over and was the dynamic person. He was a very good old... The bishop said Bunini kind of took over. Well, again, did he take over? The cardinal, I think his name was Lacaro, he was appointed to the office, so it, it wouldn't make any sense to assume... He was, you know, not there cognitively or weak because he was chosen for that position. If he's chosen for that position, I'm going to trust that he's in pretty good condition. Or it wouldn't make sense for him to be chosen for that position. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to whoever appointed him that he's in good enough condition for someone to consider him valuable in that place. So I'm not going to accept this suggestion that we assume he's not there, then have this statement that Bunini, if you've already received that assumption, kind of took over. Well, what does kind of took over mean? So I'm not, you know, again, this is a plausible narrative that is being fed to us with no evidence. And I'm not accepting, I'm not granting the assumptions. I'm not accepting the conclusions with no evidence. Now we're back to this same Benedictine monk that we've seen before. So let's uh, try to pick up here without losing. Doddering it, I don't even know how cognitively alert he was. Bonini kind of took over and was the dynamic person. He was a very good organizer. He worked long hours, and for the next five years, really, uh, he worked <coughs> assiduously on every element of the reform. Pope Paul VI himself, okay. and I quote, no predisposition to change everything without reason must govern this investigation, the investigation into the liturgy, nor a hastiness to amend and revise everything. The guides must be a devout prudence and a reverence combined with wisdom. With the best will in the world, I struggle to see in the nuts and bolts of the reform, in the way in which it was carried out, that the concilium paid much heed to the Pope. 
they were hasty. Okay, so now we have, now notice this, we have this, this guy, nobody. As far as the hierarchy of the church and the councils are concerned, this is a nobody sitting in his office chair judging the events that took place within the council to which he was not present. What evidence is there? So we're going to read the statements of the Pope, which are good. They assure us that the, the council was actually careful, that the council was not hasty, that the council did not seek some overwhelming and reckless reform. That's what the Pope tells us. This guy is now telling us that we should doubt what the Pope said. And that, you know, because he says, no matter how, you know, no matter how hard I try, I just can't, but who cares about some guy's private judgment about the hierarchy of the church? This is just another piece of the narrative. We're setting him up to present his suspicion, his doubt, as if his doubt now justifies my doubt. There's still no evidence. Now we're suggesting that Pope Paul VI's words were a bunch of baloney. Everything the church does, we're being told, was false and careless, you know, untrue. We're being told that by these guys who make a video. <clears throat> Why are we listening to this guy's opinion about the, about the council? I don't understand why anyone would even listen to this. Show us some evidence. Where is the evidence of any of these assumptions, of any of these suspicions? Where is the evidence? Almost the entire Roman liturgy was overhauled within the space of a, of a decade. A revision of almost everything. Now here, again, we have a video of an isolated situation, an isolated mass. We have a, I'm going to assume that's a priest carrying the Gospels in. We have two female altar servers. We have some piano music being played in a modern Catholic parish. We can see that the people have masks on, so this is, this is uh, probably from the COVID um, pandemic time. Well, this is an isolated instance, and again, I'm going to comment on this logically, because an isolated instance, this is, this is an example, cannot prove any universal statement. Again, I, I gave an example in the first video. If I said, my neighbor is evil, therefore all neighbors are evil, how many people would think that that was a good argument? That is the exact same argument that we have when we see a, a video or a picture from an isolated mass or church presented as proof of what is being asserted universally in the church. This is sophistry. It's irrational. So now we're going to have this video here used as evidence that these random guys with their suspicions and accusations against the church are true because we have an isolated situation, a video of an isolated case, but that doesn't prove the accusation, which is against the church, not against this particular parish or this particular priest. The accusations are being made against the council, against the pope and the bishops, not against this parish. This video would be good evidence of something, 
asserted of this parish, but not of the church. This is sophistry. Good morning. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, on the screen here, we have a comparison, okay? On the left, it seems that we're being shown what a traditional priest would do. And on the right, we're being shown what a priest will do after the Second Vatican Council. That is an, that is an individual example of a traditional priest, and I have no idea who these people are or anything, but that's an individual example of one group, and this is an individual example of another group. Neither of them prove the accusation. It's impossible to prove a general or universal accusation with individual examples. So we're going to see these compared, and we're going to say, look at these two examples. You know, which one of these do you think is 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 true? This best example we could find of one side or this worst example we could find of the other side. Again, if you're not a just person, and I don't think people who embrace this position are just people, you might like this because you're unjust. But if you even have, you know, a shred of justice, you would know that any kind of comparison like this is unfair. Why not compare that on the left to the priest's you know, saying Mass on EWTN on the right as representatives of the modern Mass. Or, or a Dominican priest. The Dominicans celebrate the new Mass. Why not have a Dominican monastery Mass on the right for comparison? Because it's sophistical. That's why. It's intended to create an appearance and not a substantial argument. Spirit. The grace of... Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. As a choir director, and a question is, what did Vatican II... Oh, I'm sorry, I just... Um, sorry, I hit, I hit pause there and, and had to find my place again. So we had this comparison there between a, tradi a, tra a traditional Catholic Mass with chanting, with a choir, and then we had this random uh, Novus Ordo Mass chosen and set up as a comparison as if that's evidence of what's being suggested here. Now, you know, and we have this, it finishes up here with this, with this choir director leading this, this uh, choir singing the Mass. So apparently, any place in any church before the Second Vatican Council, any place you went would have been like that example on the left. Any place you went in, you know, in the church before the Second Vatican Council, <coughs> you would have walked into a church where Gregorian chant was being sung and, and these, these traditional hymns were being sung by choirs in these beautiful facilities, that was what worship was like before 1970. And that other example of the old priest celebrating the Mass in a modern church with two altar girls assisting, that's what it's like in the church after the Second Vatican. Do you really believe that that's true? Do you believe that this image here, let me back up and play this again. Sorry, this is just kind of sloppy. You really believe that that's a representative Lord, of all Catholic that's... masses before the Second Vatican Council and that this is a representative of all Catholic masses after the Second Vatican Council. You really believe that that's true? 
If I can show you that that's not what masses were like in every church before the Second Vatican Council, will you admit that that's a false argument? If I can show you that this is not what all masses are like after the Second Vatican Council, will you accept that that's a false argument? Or are you already judged? I think you're probably already judged. If you, if you think this video is decent, you probably look at this and say, yeah, that's what the modern church is like. Yeah, that's what the old... So when St. Francis was, was worshiping with his Franciscan brothers in the 1200s, you think it looked like that image from the traditional Catholic church? That's what you think the worship of St. Francis looked like? And if not, do you think St. Francis's worship was inferior to that worship? I would, like to, I would like to have all of this explained. Go ahead and explain to me if St. Francis's church didn't look and sound and feel like that pretty example. Was something wrong with it? You honestly think that in medieval society where there was, you know, peasant culture and local parishes offering mass all through the countrysides, all through the farm areas, you, you honestly believe that all of those masses looked like that, tr that traditional Catholic Mass? And if not, why would you accept that as evidence? You think all modern Masses, a Dominican monastery Mass celebrating the Novus Ordo, you think it's as informal as this one Mass selected to represent unfairly the Novus Ordo Mass? Why do you accept these false, unfair representations? Because you're not just. That's why. Have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. This is what all medieval masses were like. As a choir director and as, as a singer, your, your default, if you will, or your starting point is Gregorian chant which the church says is the greatest treasure that, that, that we have in the arts, um, greater than any other art. Unfortunately, now there was just kind of a rupture where things stopped. And there was no need for composers to be trained to write for the church. There's a, there's a, there's a real tension. There's a real tension between liturgical practice, as it's always been understood, and the way the Noah's Ordo tries to grab your attention in order to you know, keep you awake, keep you engaged, giving you new ideas, having a Another theme for the Mass example. that you know, keeps coming back to something or other. My and Mass that's what doesn't you do in the look like this. You know, the great saints of the past, some of them are very simple, some of them are very complicated, some of them are great theologians, some of them were unlettered. How did they engage with the Mass? It wasn't about understanding everything that happens, it's about devotion. So what does increase devotion? Well, like St. Thomas Aquinas said, singing, having it in Latin because it's a sacred language, you can see the care that... This, the talk is coming now so rapidly. The assumptions are being made so rapidly that there's not even time to examine them. He says that Latin is a sacred language. I'm a Latin teacher. The Latin Bible is called the Vulgate. The word Vulgate comes from the word, or is related to the word vulgar, which is the opposite of sacred. The Bible was originally composed in Hebrew and Greek. They're the sacred languages because the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets and apostles to write and speak in those languages. That's why they're called the sacred languages, because they're the languages by which the Holy Spirit spoke. Now, it's no question that Latin from the you know, third century or so of the church through uh, medieval history was the standard language of the Catholic Church. That's, that's obvious. The church was also 
primarily located in, in Europe. This choir director, or this, you know, this, this guy is a member of some Latin mass society. I mean, these are all prejudiced people who, who are already, they've already judged on this issue, and they're just weaving the narrative. They're just flooding you now with these assertions as if they're experts. Two choir directors, this guy is involved in a Latin mass society. We already know what they think. We already know that we already know their opinions, but they're they're not giving any evidence. We have an assertion that oh well, the Second Vatican Council doesn't require that any music directors be trained for church music. Says who? Who ever said that? Did the did the Second Vatican Council say that that music directors no longer need to be trained? They talk about going to Mass and not understanding the Mass, not understanding what's going on, as if that's some kind of, you know, some kind of honor to say, I have no idea what the priest is saying. Why are they saying that no one understood the Mass? Why are they, why are they saying that? They're saying that because a lot of people argue and say, you know, I don't speak Latin. I don't know what the priest is saying. I don't understand. I don't live in a Catholic society like medieval Italy or medieval Spain. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not surrounded by, by Catholic culture. I can't just take up my place in a feudalistic society governed by a monarch and just put my head down and mind my business because now I live in a different world. I don't understand what the priest is saying. And the response is, well, St. Francis didn't understand either. Says who? Why, why would anyone suggest that St. Francis didn't understand what was going on at Mass? You honestly believe that the saints went to Mass and had no idea what the prayers meant or what the priest was doing or what the priest was saying? They had no idea. If it's if it's not important to understand what the priest is saying, then why do we have missiles? We have missiles because we can't necessarily hear the words of the priest. So because we can't hear the priest, we read the words of the priest. We don't just sit there and stare at the wall saying, oh, I, I have no idea what's going on, but it doesn't matter. We don't have to understand what's going on. When has the church ever taught this idea? Now, the reason why they're saying this is because so many people who attend a Latin Mass will say, I don't know what's going on. And because most, most modern people would have no idea what's going on. And that's going to be a criticism. And so they respond with just historical fantasy and say, oh, well, the saints didn't know what was going on either. They didn't care about that because it's not important. They just focused on devotion. That's just total baloney. And if again, if it's not important to understand what the priest is saying, why have a missile? It's a self-contradiction. You're showing us the missile while you contradict everything you say about how knowing what the priest says and understanding the words of the Mass is not actually what matters. The Missal, published for the people in the pews, proves that that's false. One of the reasons why the priests weren't heard was because throughout history, they didn't have microphones and speakers. So if you're in a large, noisy place, or a large place, and the priest simply has his own voice, he's got two options. He can scream the prayers so everyone can hear him. Or he can say them quietly and everyone simply read them. No one ever suggested that the whole congregation should stand there in ignorance, having no idea what's going on, and simply, you know, have, devo have a devotional experience. You see, this, this is just all baloney. It's... it's it's contradicted by the existence 
of the missile. So, again, these are men. These are none of these men are members of the hierarchy of the church. They have no official place in the church. We already know what their opinions are because of the groups that they're a part of, and they're just rapid firing now, machine gun firing. Historical assertions, claims about this and that, opinions, judgments, assumptions, firing away and pretending that this is evidence. But it's not evidence. It's not evidence. It's being taken. This is a sacred language. It's appropriate to these sacred rites. Having it um, in silence is a way of emphasizing its holiness. It's a way of exciting devotion. Now, all these things... people. How does silence excite devotion? How does silence excite devotion? What a wacky thing to say. Silence excites devotion. You really believe that that's true? If that's true, shouldn't the whole thing be silent? Why do we have a liturgy of the word if silence arouses devotion, wouldn't hearing the word arouse devotion? And these same folks are going to say that the statues and the pictures arouse devotion, but now silence arouses devotion? As I said, there are, there are simple practical reasons why priests prayed in silence. It wasn't because it was some kind of magical necessity. And if you introduce something like electricity and a lapel mic and a speaker system to the church, how many of the priests would think, you know, it's really best if we just continue saying all the prayers of the Mass in silence when we could, we could make it known and heard to the whole congregation? This is just silliness. Barriers to comprehension. Well, how important is that? compared with the effect it has on devotion. And actually, how much of a barrier is it? The argument there, so, so this is the argument, get this. The argument is, what matters is devotion, not understanding. And I would, I would just like you to, you heard it, he said that himself. Let's just listen to this again. Very complicated. Some of them were great theologians, some of them were unlettered. How did they engage with the Mass? It wasn't about understanding everything that happens, it's about devotion. So what does increase devotion? Well, like St. Thomas Aquinas said, singing, having it in Latin because it's a sacred language. So St. Thomas, St. Thomas said that, you know, if you study St. Thomas, what you come away with is that singing increases devotion and having it in Latin increases devotion. Language, you can see the care that's being taken. This is a sacred language, it's appropriate to these sacred rites. Having it um, in silence is a way of emphasizing its holiness. It's a way of exciting devotion. Now, all these things that people say, well, they're, they're barriers to comprehension. Well, how important is that? How important is comprehension? I mean, can you, can you, can you imagine that someone would... I, I can't believe that someone would actually say this. What kind of audience must you be to have someone think that he can get away with saying, you don't need to comprehend it. All that matters is that you have your devotion aroused. Who cares if you comprehend it? I mean, he literally just made this argument that comprehension doesn't matter. And he appealed to the saints as if they're examples of ignorant worshipers who just, you know, were stirred up to devotion 
and didn't understand what was going on. St. Thomas Aquinas is appealed to as an advocate of worshiping God without understanding, as long as you sing. Oh, and, and also, it needs to be in Latin. So, you need to sing. You need to sing in Latin. You don't, you don't need to understand it. You, you, you know, stop, stop asking questions about what this means and what that means. Don't worry about that because the silence and the singing and the Latin will arouse in you true devotion. You honestly believe that any doctor of the church has ever taught anything like that? Who cares about comprehension? Stop bugging us about comprehension. What matters is this, this arousal of, uh, of devotion. You know, devotion, do you feel it? Do you feel, do you feel the silence? Do you feel the devotion welling up? What kind of crazy Protestant nonsense is this? I really can't believe that this guy in his pink shirt is mocking the importance of comprehension to true worship. Nuts. Compared with the effect it has on devotion. And actually, how much of a barrier is it? If the liturgy is, is an uninterrupted flow of vernacular words, oh my goodness. then unfortunately, <laughs> even if those words are about religious things, it, it makes it much closer to what we're surrounded with in the world all the time, which is this unending stream of, of noise and voices, journalism and television and you know, YouTube and whatever. If you never have any silence, you could go through a whole mass and just, and just walk out and never have prayed once. What did that even mean? Okay. Contemplative nuns the in the traditional community. Offertory. Here we have another bishop, and I am familiar with this bishop because he's a famous maverick in the news all the time. Um, so we're going to get, you know, th this, this bishop, his opinions at least at this point in his life, do not represent those of the Pope and other bishops. He's a maverick bishop with an eccentric opinion. So presenting him in all of his bishop garb as if he speaks on behalf of the hierarchy of the church is a misrepresentation. I hope that's clear to you. This bishop's opinions do not represent the opinions of all of the bishops and the Pope. And I don't mean all of them as if many of them agree with him. He represents himself in his opinions and most nearly all of the bishops in the church do not agree with this Bishop Schneider. He certainly is not uh, supported by the judgment of the Pope. He himself identifies as an eccentric. That's the kind of person you're going to have giving you this information. In the Novus Ordo, which are substantially prayers for a meal, for a banquet. That's a Protestant style prayers taken from a Jewish supper prayer. Come. Notice what an accusation that was. The prayers of the Novus Ordo Mass are basically mealtime prayers taken from a Jewish dinner prayer. Does the Pope share that opinion? Do all the other bishops share that opinion? No, of course not. This is the opinion of one unhappy maverick bishop, and his opinion is not Catholic doctrine. That's not how the Catholic Church works. It's not the opinion of one isolated bishop. Arius was a bishop. He was a heretic. Should we have Arius show up in his bishop clothes, come on our video and give us his opinion and present that with a false appeal to authority, which is a fallacy? No. 
Bishop Schneider does not represent the, the judgment of the church. That's his own opinion. He doesn't like the Novus Ordo. Okay, say so. Say, I don't like the Novus Ordo. You don't have to make it more than that. Now we're going to go show you a clip from, I guess this is, oh yeah, Ben-Hur. And of course, this movie clip, you know, it proves everything. That's how, that's how wise men dealing with sober subjects prove their arguments. They appeal to, to clips from Hollywood. Let us have dinner. And he was never in the church. Just like the Novus Ordo Mass. the offertory I mean, must mass express is, the is goal of exactly the Mass, like which is a sacrifice and not a meal. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the world. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, who bringeth to us bread from the earth. The bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. The priest facing Adorian. Okay, first of all, the argument there is that the argument there is that the emotion of the priest is being judged. And again, this is a, an isolated clip. The emotion of the priest is being judged to not be serious enough for the celebration of the mass. The the emotional, you know, reciting of the prayers, the level of emotional engagement is, is said to not be of sufficient degree to be proper for the celebration of the Mass. It feels like a dinner table prayer. So, again, this is not a matter of black and white, true and false. This is a question of degree. How would, where would the line be where exactly is the line that we can formally establish and say this is the right degree of emotion? You know, Padre Pio, for example, Padre Pio would often weep as he celebrated Mass. Okay, we can imagine, we can imagine Padre Pio celebrating Mass. Do you think that that was normal? before the Second Vatican Council? Do you think that that was normal? And so Padre Pio then is, is really not remarkable because he's just a normal, a normal traditional priest. Do you think that that emotional recitation of the prayers of the Mass was normal in Padre Pio or was he, was he singular in that emotion? with which he prayed. Uh, of course he was singular. Of course he was singular, right? So, <clears throat> again, where would the line be drawn? How, how would this question of emotional seriousness, how would it be judged? How would it be judged? And if I go to a Latin Mass and I find that the priest isn't weeping like Padre Pio, do I say, oh, he doesn't, he, he's, he's not a true priest. He's not a true priest. And if I go to the Novus Ordo Mass and I find a priest is very emotional, do I say, now that's the truth. That's a real priest. So, so a certain emotional behavior while celebrating the Mass is now an objective measure of of, of true and false liturgy. I mean, of course, you can't even... You can't even maintain this argument. So, again, it, it's just nonsense. Um, so we're going to appeal to emotion. Like there, there should be a certain level of emotion. That's what proves it. So we don't need to understand it. We, we need to make sure we say it in Latin, though, because that's necessary for devotion. We also need to make sure we're singing because if we study St. Thomas... What we, what we conclude from the study of St. Thomas is that singing is important. Um, there needs to be silence, Latin language, singing, um, and the priest has to have a certain level of emotional trouble as he offers the Mass for it to be a real Mass. That's going to be our argument. 
Um, we're already 55 minutes into this. I feel like this is just getting worse as we go here. Um, I'm trying to get through more content. We're through 15 and a half minutes now. I just don't, I don't understand what the argument is. I don't understand what the position is. You honestly don't believe that improving comprehension is an improvement? You honestly believe that isolated examples are conclusive of anything? You honestly believe that we should judge the emotional character of the priest as a test of whether he really believes in the Eucharist or not? You don't, you don't think that some people are more emotional than others? You don't think that some people are more you know, stoic and other people more emotional and that it has nothing to do with what they actually believe or you think that emotional activity is more important than comprehension? What's the argument here? What I find, and again, I'm, I'm sorry because I know that this video is kind of sloppy because, uh, like I said, none of this is prepared or scripted. But this is just Protestantism. Is this not Protestantism? Let's let's focus not on let's focus not on the substance but let's you know don't, don't bug me with questions of comprehension the question is really how you feel how do you feel do you feel like you're being you know do you feel like your devotion is being excited but i don't understand what it's saying well who cares about that how do you feel do you can't you feel your devotion being aroused by this latin prayer well, what is the Latin, what's, the, what's he saying? Oh, don't worry about that. That's, why is that important? What I'm asking you is, how do you feel being here? How does it feel? Do you feel your devotion being aroused by the silence, by the Latin, by the singing? Look at the priest. Look how emotional he is. How do you feel? Does that, does that arouse devotion in you? This really, I mean, I, I understand that it doesn't look like Protestantism, but everything about it thus far sounds like Protestantism. It's Protestantism. It's just Protestantism for guys who culturally like the Latin Mass. That's really what it is. It's a, a sort of emotional, individual, subjective judgment of what true worship is for people who like European culture. That's what this feels like to me. Comprehension is not important. It has to be in Latin for some reason. Um, there has to be Gregorian chant. It has to be Gregorian chant. Um, and if you have that and an emotional priest on top, like the cherry on top, then you have real worship. But if these things are lacking, if you're worried about comprehension, if you're not emotional, then it's just not true worship. And we're, we're just getting into this subjective... Protestantish stuff. So this video, I think that I just did 59 minutes in, this video stinks. It's just a sort of a chaotic response to this terrible video. But I think that it's helpful in that, for me at least, it's revealed what's really going on here. It's revealed what's really going on here. This is really uh, humanistic, relativistic, subjective, emotional judgment about two different liturgies and we're preferring one because we simply like it and it arouses in us sort of an emotional feeling that we call devotion which is distinct from comprehension 
and we find ourselves aroused by this certain thing, and we assume that anyone who's interested in the modern Mass simply isn't interested in being devoted to God. They're just, I guess they're all just obsessed with comprehension, which is you know, obviously not true. Um, so it's helpful in that we've, we've sort of uncovered what the real gist of this is. So I'm going to stop here. I'll try to clean this up in the, in the next episode because I don't want to spend too much time doing this. But boy, what a bunch of junk. And uh, like I said, before I said childish, silly, now, you know, ignorant and emotional, we're adding to that. You know, identifying devotion with emotion, that's, that's a new one. So anyway, we're stopping around the 15 and a half minute mark. Um, I don't know how many more of these I'm, gonna, I'm going to do. This is, this is really a waste of time for me and anyone else watching these. So... Hopefully we can wrap this up uh, with one more video.